there was a very long article released about one Andrew Huberman by the New York Magazine. The cover story was called Falling for Dr. Huberman by Kerry Howley. As the title suggests, this is a rather critical piece. It essentially covers Huberman's personal relationships, yes, but also alleges that he's oversold his backstory about his troubled upbringing and humble beginnings and that he is not running a productive lab as presented. There doesn't seem to be much going on at Stanford. And generally, there is presented as a relatively narcissistic, flaky person, um, quite self-obsessed. But the main issue which got attention was that he is revealed to have been simultaneously dating six women while making them believe that they are dating exclusively, monogamously, right? And this includes like sharing living arrangements with one of them and and also having them undergo IVF fertility treatments, right, to try and increase the chance to get pregnant. So this is seen as being somewhat counter to the image which he has tried to develop of a considerate, very thoughtful science guy, you know, compassionate guy, as he comes across in the piece, it presents him like sort of sociopathic, right? Somebody that is perfectly content with manipulating six people simultaneously. And and there's other weird things about one of the points made is that he is encouraging unprotected sex with his partners without divulging to them, you know, all the other activities that he's engaged in and some one of yep. them gets a sexually transmitted disease, right? Yeah. So insisting uh, on unprotected sex while at the same time secretly having sex with a lot of other people. Yeah. Yeah. No, the reaction to this piece has been rather varied. One category of reaction is to say, this is just a hit piece. It's it's digging through the dirt, bringing up ex-girlfriends and their you know, stories. And there's always he said, she said aspects to this. And what does this really have to do with the content that Huberman is pointing out. Like, isn't this just gossip, right? Tabloid level gossip. That's That's been well, one reaction. Uh, I think I, I saw something with someone had described it as, I guess, defended him as not judging people for a, a polyamoric <laughs> lifestyle, <laughs> which it seems to be, you know, a fairly blatant rebranding, you know, like a 1950s madman territory. You know, you'd simply call someone like this a womanizer, right? Or a, you know, a creep. But, you know, you can't just say, well, I've unilaterally declared that I'm, I'm a member he's of He's in an involuntary and- polycule. He, he's created a, <laughs> But the, and people pointed out that, like, the New York Mag has positive articles about polyamorous relationships. But the, the key point there is that people in polyamorous relationships, whatever you think about them, Everybody is supposed to be informed <laughs> that they're in a poly avarice relationship. <laughs> that, that seems key. That does seem key. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that is generally something stressed. So when it is one person who is in the know that they're in multiple simultaneous relationships and the other are unaware, that's not the same as mm. the polyamorous ideal, right? Now, what about the fact, Matt, that it's irrelevant? That, you know, this is just personal gossip. We all have things in our lives that you know we wouldn't want discussed in public so why yeah. are we digging through the garbage on Huberman's personal relationships that's right it's it's just salacious gossip he's doing nothing more than putting that expensive testosterone replacement therapy to good use what's the point of being an alpha if you don't get what you want <laughs> yeah some people i believe some of his fans did mention the charming phrase chad ramming <laughs> oh. he's just He's just Chad ramming or whatever the case might be. He's a millionaire, Matt. He's a super influential man. He's very handsome and rugged and virile. And so what? He chooses to, you know, lead on six women. 
what are we, you know, mm. moralizing church Nazis? We, this is 2024. A person, an individual can do what they want, right? People can do what they want. Um, Yeah, look, I mean, look, there is obviously an aspect to it, which is, yeah, a personal hit piece in a way. You know what I mean? It, it may be a well-founded hit piece, but, you know, just like with, say, Donald Trump, you know, and the various personal revelations that occurred there. Uh, at one level, it is about him personally, and it isn't about his policies or, or whatever, but people still consider it relevant so yeah look i mean for me like i'm I'm not such a high decoupler that i'm gonna take anything that is like the various bits of information you have about somebody's background about the kind of people they associate with the, the way they conduct themselves in their personal lives i mean a, a lot of this stuff can be relevant when you're forming an opinion about someone and way before these revelations i mean this doesn't really change our evaluation of him no. very much at all because we identified a whole bunch of issues that we've got with his approach to his podcasting career science communication and, and science yeah. communication and the way he evaluates literature and his somewhat disturbing connections to the woo health and you know maximizer alpha male manosphere type thing which yeah he has like a dual personality in his public broadcast which is presenting himself as you know, a very normal, a very respectable researcher and not just a manosphere bro pushing woo health and supplements. And, you know, so for me, this further information about his personal life, while you have to treat it with, you know, you, you don't necessarily assume that everything that is written is 100% true, it does fit with the less charitable interpretation that you and I had about uh, his activities. There is validity to the criticism that one, the piece is overwritten. It's extremely long. It, it's, I would say, 10,000 words or more, right? And it gives a lot of detail as a result. You know, it's at times feels like, what is the point of this four paragraphs you've spent on a particular issue? And I think there's legitimate points to be raised there. But one aspect that I would want to emphasize is that. It isn't just a matter of he said, she said. For a magazine like this to publish this kind of piece, they would have done fact-checking. And the story that they are recounting involves people receiving messages, receiving videos, and so on. And they indicate in the piece that they have confirmed via these sources and the fact that they have you know, multiple sources giving the same account from different perspectives it means it isn't just he said, she said. So anything that's in that piece will have been checked to make sure it's not actionable, right? That they have reason to support it. And similarly, that's why they provide the responses from Huberman's spokesperson consistently, right? Like denying things and then saying where well, the evidence contradicts what has been said there. So it isn't just the case of he said, she said. Yes, it doesn't mean that you should take every account that's provided, um, every quotation by the women as the God's honest truth and the exact objective presentation of, you know, what happened. But it is also not the case that everything is just equally as likely, right? No, it definitely seems that there was a misrepresentation of exclusivity with these women. Now, that's one thing. But the other is that people are mistaking this as, so if somebody has six girlfriends, like we shouldn't be able to heed their health advice. And no, that's not the point. The point is somebody who presents themselves in a certain way and then has a personal life which suggests a completely different mm. character than is presented to the public. That is what is usually considered hypocritical, right? You know, like the preacher saying gay people are an abomination and then sleeping with gay prostitutes, right? Or mm -hmm. meal prostitutes, whatever the case might be. It's the delta between their public persona and what they are actually engaged in, right? That's mm -hmm. part of the thing that people are missing. So Huberman's presentation of himself as a very down the earth, uh, humble science guy who is producing content about resisting giving in the temptation, about treating people with respect, about how to form meaningful relationships. And then you get a piece which is essentially detailing a litany of abusive, manipulative relationships. And also as part of that, using optimizer and therapeutic language to justify your behavior, right? It, it speaks 
to a worrying disconnect between your public and private personas. The analogy with the uh, religious preacher who's got a, a dodgy personal life, that sort of holds with, with him a bit, doesn't it? I mean, he he's followed the, the line of a, a lot of our heterodox type influences in proclaiming a belief in God and sort of finding religion. That, that happened yeah. months ago, I think. Yeah. yeah, and he has talked about the importance of like honesty in relationships and all these kind of things. In fact, Matt, there's a clip that's been doing the round where he was talking to David Buss, the evolutionary psychologist who talks about male and female relationship patterns and these kind of things. And, and listen to this segment. You can't have long-term affairs with six different partners. Yeah, unless he's um, juggling multiple uh, phone accounts or something. Right, like that, right, so. right. And some men try to do that, but um, I think it's a... But, could be very taxing. <laughs> so the brothers of the intense people, you know, yeah. inserted the Kobe enthusiasm music at the end. But that was them talking about, you know, men who would do this kind of thing about, you know, yeah. having different phone accounts and all that kind of stuff. And Huberman's response to this was also interesting because he tweeted out, if you go and look at this account, he's just tweeted out some promotional stuff from the episode. He hasn't said anything about it, right? Except the episode that he released was one with a magician talking about, you know, the psychology of magic and whatnot. And let's just listen to a segment of the clip that he used, you know, to promote the episode. It's like falling out of love. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, that's really... I mean, a, a, a previous guest on the podcast, Carl Dyseroth, one of the best bioengineers, neuroscientists, and psychiatrists in the world, um, went on Lex Friedman podcast, and they were talking about love. And Carl said something interesting that's very relevant here. He said, um, he's a colleague of mine at Stanford, very poetic guy. Um, he said, you know, love between two people, romantic love, that is, is one of the few things in life that we collaborate with someone to story something into the future. Hmm. You, you know, this is different than the love of a child or a sibling or a parent or a pet, et cetera, or a friend, right? That you're creating a story that's based on real experience of past and present, yeah. but there's this storying forward of love. That's great. And, um, and falling out of love involves, of course, the ending of the story moving forward, but also a, in some cases, sadly, a revision of the events of the past. Yeah, so I wonder if there was any subtext to the uh, <laughs> choice of clips that he used there. Yeah, yeah, so he released that after this article came to light. He hasn't responded to the article directly, but he released that. No, he just released a, a clip indicating that when relationships end, people have a tendency to feel disappointed and revise their assessment of the relationship so yeah maybe revise the facts and yeah yeah but the point there as well matt if you assume that this was not you know planned as a response is huberman is often talking very sincerely about relationships and love and connection and human bonding and these kind of things with his audience right so mm -hmm. i feel that this is why some people would regard the revelations as being contradictory to that image that he cultivates. And actually, if you go, although you can find, you find immediately the heterodox sphere, the kind of Lex Friedman extolling, you know, how much Andrew Huberman is a good man, Scott Adams retweeting things about, you know, the media attacking him or whatever. His subreddit actually does have a lot of people saying, well, this is just causing me you know, to have a very different opinion mm. of Andrew. And it's fair to say there's also a clear gender divide in the responses where women have recognized the issue that, you know, his behavior indicates more readily. Whereas mm. with men, there does tend to be more, well, boys will be boys. You know, he's a millionaire alpha. What did you expect? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th the way that the usual suspects and the podcasters stand just join shoulder to shoulder on things like this every time something like this comes up. Like Lex Fridman's response there was totally predictable from him. And this is someone, Lex, you know, he's all about, you know, just, just pure love and- Love, and, you know, honesty. And, and all, all of those things, schmaltzy, saccharine, 
bullshit, frankly. And of course, his response to this was, it's heartbreaking to see a hit piece written about my friend, Andrew Huberman. I know him very well and can definitively say that he is a great human being, scientist and educator. Hit piece attacks like this are simply trash, clickbait journalism. Desperately, I can't read the rest because he's blocked me. So Clinging um, on to relevance, Andrew should be celebrated, period. His podcast has helped millions of people, including me, lead health for your lives. Keep going, brother. And yeah. that response is very illustrative. But one thing to say though, Matt, so what, Lex? And so what all these bros that are talking about, you know, Huberman's benefit? That doesn't actually undo any of the things that are detailed in that piece. You can get benefit, but it isn't all about you and your workout routine, right? That's like not the point of the article. But in terms of Lex, it totally illustrates what you've said before, which is that his like hyper empathy and hyper love is extremely selective. And in this case, yeah. it's very selective in terms of being targeted at his mate. Bro. Bro Huberman. And he'd be the same with Joe Rogan or any of these other people, but certainly certainly would not extend it to other parties, I think. Just trash, hit piece journalism, nothing to see here. Yeah, and the other response that you see quite a lot is people beginning their take by saying, I haven't read the piece on Huberman, but, <laughs> right? And the, as it just it's very common that people don't read the piece. They focus on their interpersonal relationship with Huberman, I find him they always be nice. You know, we he's always been very kind and important to me. And then, like you say, relating it to where they see him as sitting in the culture war. So if they're a heterodox podcasting bro, then absolutely fine. What's the issue? And vice versa as well. I feel like people have very, very uh, flexible standards. Uh, another thing you said to me is that if it was like Ibrahim X Kendi, about which, you know, these personal dealings had come to light, which didn't reflect well on him, they would not forego <laughs> the opportunity to put the boot in, now, right? Some consistent people might, but generally speaking, no. And this thing in the general heterodox sphere about high decoupling them and that kind of thing. It is very rarely practice consistency. So they do not take the arguments of people they dislike in isolation from the people. That is very rare. It It is almost always somebody who they agree with that has done something bad that they don't want to focus on. Selective decoupling. I've decided to brand this. Selective decoupling. Yes, yeah, selective decoupling is, is correct. It is a plague, an epidemic at the minute. So basically the summary is, Matt, the piece presents somebody who engages in self-mythologizing, who's deceitful, uses therapy speak or optimizing terminology in order to justify self-gratification and fairly abusive behavior. And that is completely contradictory to the public image that Huberman has attempted to cultivate. So it's notable. For that reason, it doesn't matter if Huberman wants to sleep around with tons of people, that that's all fine, you know, and he has disagreements with his exes, that's fine. But the reason that this piece is notable is because of the discrepancy between the public and private image that it details and some of the worrying manipulative tendencies, right? Mm -hmm. So... No, you don't have to stop listening to Huberman for your protocols if that's what you get. But like, you also perhaps should consider, you know, the people that you're getting your important life advice from, how far they exemplify, you know, the values that they're preaching about. I think that does matter a little, but, you know, maybe the, some people, not at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we had our take of him and what his operation modus operandi is and it was different from how he presented himself as being nothing more than you know a scientist and a public educator and somebody who is looking to promote health this new information is entirely consistent with our take on him and is inconsistent with the way he presents himself so the one last thing i'll say about the whole thing is there's a segment at the very end of the article where they detail him talking to a guy, Conti, I think it's a therapist, uh, and, and a particularly a therapist that Huberman has worked with. And they're analyzing this email which Huberman got, which he read as passive aggressive, where some colleague, 
you know, says when he doesn't respond to an email in time that they guess he didn't want to collaborate on the topic, right? And him and Paul Conti then spend around nine minutes on their podcast dissecting the psychological flaws in that person and, you know, what what are all the issues that they have that are going into that kind of response. And so this article represents that Huberman often, like, you know, doesn't respond to things in time or whatever, which is not a big sin. But the point is, willingness to analyze someone's character publicly for nine minutes on your podcast and then argue that, you know, well, nobody should be interested in any details about how you behave, you know, interpersonally with people. It feels like an inconsistency to me. And the fact that him and the therapist don't consider maybe the issue isn't with the other person, right? Maybe there is a legitimate grievance or something like that. Like that just speaks, I think, to some of the issues involved here and the different levels of charity being granted. That's it, Matt. And you don't have to think that the women involved are saints or that any of that. You don't have to take everything on trust. Just take it for what it is. A critical article which details, you know, some worrying tendencies. Agreed. 